Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second session of Digital Dontics webinar series. This is Mahmoud Rabishti with you from the Digital Dontics International Academy. It's our pleasure and honor to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Ken Hui from the King's Way Prostodontics, Australia. Dr. Hui will share with us his experience in artificial intelligence in prostodontics. Dr. Ken is a prostodontist and owner of the King's Way Prostodontics, a private practice in Mirinda, Sydney, providing several services for all phases of prostodontics, including implants, aesthetics, and reconstructive dentistry. Between 2005 and 2019, he held multiple clinical supervision, clinical simulation, and presenter roles within Sydney Dental School, undergraduate, postgraduate implants and prosthodontic programs, and professional education. Charles Sturt University and James Cook University, postgraduate implant program. He is currently the chair of the scientific and continuing professional development committees of Academy of Australian and New Zealand Prostodontists, AANZP. His roles with the Australian Prostodontic Society include past federal president from 2013 until 2015, an executive member of its Education and Research Committee 2020, Dr. Ken previously held executive membership with continuing education in the industry, Sydney Dental School, from 2011 until 2019, including a five-year term as its final chair. In addition, Dr. Ken is a managing director of Creed CE, an organization providing professional education services for dentists. So just before... Um, Dr. Ken start his uh, presentation. I would like to raise your attention that uh, you can write down your um, questions in the Q&A section. And once uh, Dr. Ken finish his presentation, he will be happy to answer all these questions. So uh, Ken, I'm so glad to having you with us here today. And um, I think uh, the stage is yours. So uh, please, uh, uh, you can, Share your screen. Okay, looks good. Thanks, Mahmoud. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Mahmoud, for a very uh, generous introduction. Thanks for having me along. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I know you take some time out from your patients and your daily schedule. I um, uh, this, this presentation is, uh, as you would expect from... Uh, a clinical a dentist. Um, it's uh, it's not. There's not. I, I don't hold any uh, research or um, or formal or formal posts within artificial intelligence in 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 anything. Um, these are this presentation is mainly uh, observational narrative. I've held an interest in this um, this area for a while, uh, for many years since my um, postgraduate work. And in the last few years, um, I've, I've had the opportunity to present this type of material across a broad range of topic areas um, with locally with the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons starting in 1920, 2019-2020. Um, the International College of Prostodontists, which is where I met um, Mahmoud <clears throat> last year uh, in our scientific meeting. Um, uh, later last year was with uh, International Team of Implantology, Earlier this year, uh, the Sydney International Dental uh, Dental Convention, uh, and with our ANZAP meeting in a biennial ANZAP scientific meeting in July earlier this year, um, I thought that that was going to be my final presentation until Mahmoud asked me to join. <laughs> <Did> you... <laughs> we honour we honour <laughs> <Very having you. laughs> so, thank, Thankfully, there was only back in July. And there's there's a couple more. Uh, updated publications and for which you'll be able to find um, at the on our Creed website um, listed on to, in the publications page there. So uh, if you uh, if you have any interest in anything, what I'm saying that you know just um, you know happy to share 
any of the publications with you, but the list of the publications is there on that page. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really pleased to join you. And you'll also notice here that I've written that the Digital Odontics webinar is actually the 25th of November. Um, <laughs> it's the, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's early morning in uh, in Sydney, and uh, we really appreciate uh, we keeping you awake until this time. So thank you so no, no, much, Kim. No. <laughs> so um, yeah, so again, a warm thank you to uh, Mahmoud as well as uh, you know my consultants and colleagues along the way that have given me both um, a mentorship, uh, consultant advice um their time uh their unpaid time as well as the various environments that have uh, enabled me to uh develop this uh this stuff which i'm really just having a lot of fun with um i've broken this presentation down to four sections uh i'll talk a, a, a lot about clinical technologies because i know that's what you guys want to uh understand um i want to also talk about personalized health which is i think um, very important for us to get a grip on right at this moment in time and because that's going to feature as heavily as the technologies over the next five to ten years um, for us. Um, I'm going to brush over what I think are some very important concepts of governance, responsible AI, um, social and ethical infrastructure, the things that will um, uh, limit our progress, uh, not so much to hold us back, but to make sure that we're doing the right thing for everyone. Um, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up with some, uh, just some ideas for how we might progress ourselves as professional bodies, individuals, um, through the use of some education technologies. This, this I think is a really, uh, just a, it's obviously a very small subset of clinical technology, so ones I think that are all contributing, that will contribute heav heavily towards, um, you know, the, the dis various disruptions of AI in dentistry and prosthodontics. I think that the the actual disruption, the disruptive technologies, um, will actually be of 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 uh, that are AI based and AI driven will actually be a sum total of all the different um, technologies, disruptions themselves. Um, so that's why I think that the, this group is, is quite special. Uh, mechatronic robots, a lot of you would be you know, already familiar with uh, load sensor robots that uh, replicate um, you know, human joints um, and the delivery of um, uh, you know, sort of actual physical interventions, whether it's surgery, uh, whether it's um, something that's in the lab, um, piecing together or bending wires. Um, social robots will feature very heavily in our future. Um, there's not really a lot that's been reported in dentistry yet, but social robots um, are very important, will be an important part in history taking. Um, the environments that has been explored have so far been in primary care, emergency uh, mental health units in hospital environments, but I see it, uh, a big role for it in, in our future, especially in diagnostic services. Optical coherence tomography is really exciting. Um, I, I wish I could spend a lot more time talking about it. I won't, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Mumwood and uh, your colleagues will feature this very heavily uh, in your future. Um, uh, endeavors with digital odontics. Um, it's a big watch this space. Um, clinical decision support systems is where I'll, I'll talk mainly throughout this uh, this next sort of phase. And uh, some 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 great um, uh, other sort of subsets of clinical science include carbon nanotube membranes, grand zirconium stem cells, which I think will play a, a big feature in um, both research and eventually in clinical practice. Um, so one other thing that I should mention as well is that yes, I'm not. I'm just a punter. I'm I'm a I'm just a clinician. I'm a full time dentist, like like all of you, or well, like many of you. I beg your pun. Um, I don't share any university titles like many of you, but I uh, I am currently enrolled in a six month um, professional certificate in data science and artificial intelligence, um, so that I can actually get some. Um, formal training in this and uh, perhaps 
next year uh, once it's done and dusted and um, my capstone projects and uh, and a few um, side endeavours uh, are out of the way, then I hope to report back to you some more exciting stuff. Uh, 1997, an English group um, published um, knowledge-based systems for removal partial denture design. Um, the development of RAPID, which is an acronym for um, designing removal partial dentures using artificial intelligence. Designing of RAPID was uh, rationalised through um, the uh, the UK National Health Service um, and what is obviously a very, we all know it's a very, it's probably one of the most subjective areas. It probably wins the award for the greatest subjective area within dentistry. Um, but this practice, uh, this group was um, uh, very thoughtful uh, and one of a few groups at the time that were um, looking at uh, commercializing um, partial dental design into uh, some form of artificial intelligence. Um, the key design here is that it's using a rule-based system, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and the rationale for using this is quite clear. Um, you know, the, the 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 fact that if you've got this existing in a, in a practice, not only can it sort of standardize training and realign um, uh, competencies within clinicians within that practice, but beyond the um, the exit of any particular clinician, the, the, the service stays and the system stays, which is what we want for all our practices, but often doesn't happen. 20 years later, um, across the Atlantic uh, Ocean uh, in New Jersey, um, uh, this uh, prosthetic press graduate uh, published uh, his PhD on clinical decision support systems for tooth retention or extraction, which is another real fundamental decision point in our daily practice. Um, probably the most, um, uh, in my view, the most fundamental decision in prosthetic practice. Um, and this, uh, this project also involved a rule-based system this, uh, instead of starting from scratch, the, they actually used an existing uh, platform called Excess COVID, um, which uh, enables uh, the user to develop um, a rule-based decision support system um, with um, a, a preset um, infrastructure, hierarchy of decisions um, and set protocol. Um, for which they could then work with and uh, customize for their own um, their own project, and these are some of the factors. Well, these were the factors that were uh, included, and as you can see, it's quite um, you know it's it's very comprehensive. Um, each of those is obviously subject to um, you know interpretation as well, whether it be by the experience of the clinician, the environment that this is being taught or managed and handled. Um, how customized it, it will then be for the user in private practice. Um, and most of these were using a, uh, a Boolean system of true, false, or yes, no, or binary decision point. Um, so I've presented uh, two different rule-based system decision support systems 20 years apart. Um, if we go back to this first real comprehensive report, J, uh, J, uh, General Dental Education by White, uh, another English author uh, in 1996, who um, <clears throat> defined or helped us understand by definition algorithmic systems. And you can see the decision tree <clears throat> diagram there, uh, statistical systems, which um, uh, they've, they're featured with the, a Bayesian um, a model uh, or the formula rather. And, um, and rule-based systems, which is actually a more applied version of an algorithmic system. Um, seven years later, uh, in Indonesia from the uh, Columbia University in New York, um, who was a, a doctor, uh, a physician, who was also uh, doing a PhD or had finished a PhD in biomedical informatics, um, published this Perspectives in Dentistry for Clinical Decision Support Systems and um, gave uh, a nice, very neat um, sort of um, uh, infographic to 
uh, let us understand how it works. Um, but the uh, the key thing is that it was a, a, a progression on what White had reported um, that the inference engine being the actual brain or the artificial brain of the system can be algorithmic, probabilistic, uh, rule-based or probabilistic you know, or statistical rule-based. And also she introduced the concept of the neural network. The neural network um, was in, so it was, it was kind of first reported in the 40s or the 1940s um, and um, had been, it's been sort of thrown around in various disciplines and, and really in medical uh, and dental, um, but it did start to emerge by this stage um, between the white and the Dodger paper. Um, the neural network is really the, the basis for the modern day interpretation or the 2022 interpretation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I've used this uh, publication uh, one because it was provided by my friend um, and uh, who uh, Clarence Tan, who's a polymath and a graduate of the Singularity University in California, um, because it's a very neat and very succinct uh, analogy of the biological neuron and the artificial neuron. So we all we're all um, we've all studied um, clinical science and, and basic science uh, in this audience. We understand how the top figure works. Um, there's the neuron, which is a cell body. There's a contributing signals via the dendrites. And then once it, the cell body has reached a, um, a, a threshold of electrical activity um, by depolarization, then it shoots the actual potential, uh, which in concept within the brain is, uh, is obviously um, just another contributor to the, um, uh, to the process of consciousness, whether it be sensory or matter. Uh, the analogy with the artificial neuron is that there is the, uh, in the middle, uh, there's the, the body itself. Um, the, the, the data scientists call this the hidden layer. And to the left of this, where you've got X1, X2, and X, and X, sorry, I beg your pardon, X1, X2, and XJ. Um, IJ, what's our big pun? You'll see them on <laughs> XW. Uh, these, these are the contributing signals. Um, uh, the W points are, are known as nodes, and the Xs are the actual contributions of data into the nodes. Um, the, so that's the, <clears throat> that's the, um, uh, the initial layer. Um, then you've got the, the, in the intermediate layer, then the output, the input layer, but, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the input layer. And the hidden layer, then the output layer. Once the um, once the the artificial neuron has reached a threshold moment of decision and says um, it believes that this equals that, uh, and then uh, the signals moved on, and that's the, the transfer function indicates the um, processing of the actual decision. Um, moving forward, two thousand eighteen, more recently, um, this group uh, published. Uh, the history and application of artificial neural networks in dentistry. And um, their, their language is a little bit um, firmer. They define um, the older systems weak and the strongest system, and the latest system strong. Um, even though weak, uh, they've defined as mean a system in which human beings take advantage of some medical and logical mechanisms in which intelligence works to efficiently execute intellectual activities a human can, can perform. Um, the fact that it's weak doesn't necessarily mean it's less relevant in, in, in an educational environment. This is uh, very appropriate. Um, in other industries, finance, accounting, where you need an audit trail, it's very, it's, 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 you know, it's actually essential um, for operations. Um, so again, the, the, the language here is strict with data science in that it's a, it's a, it's weak intelligence as opposed to strong intelligence, which is, um, uh, you know, sort of more towards neural networks and machine learning where the capacity of a system that can act appropriately in an uncertain environment, self-consciously reach uh, the stage of recognizing and understanding the object in an autonomous and active way. <clears throat> More recently, um, this group 
um, uh, published artificial intelligence and dentistry, uh, including Forge and Dick, who's the um, uh, one of the editors in chief for the Journal of Dental Research, uh, su special supplement edition on artificial of data science in oral health and oral oral and dentistry. Um, this was um, <clears throat> a very very nice, eloquent, um, and a contem a contemporary um infographic for, to help us understand how we got here and, and where we're going so you can see the um where we've got a big um, software 1.0 um which is what i described uh, happened between a davenport and syed and uh, with their rule-based systems um whereas uh, these days uh, artificial true artificial intelligence is where software 2.0 is currently uh, where it's got machine learning, data outcomes, engineered features, and then deep learning, which I'll talk a little bit about later as well. Um, more recently, earlier this year, um, data dentistry, how data are changing clinical care and research. This, um, this, is, this is a nice, really nice representation of various clinical technologies using the Gartner Hype Cycle. Um, the, the, the Gartner Corporation um, is a standard and poor listed company um, which um, publishes these uh, amongst many, many things in various industries, um, This uh, their, their version of the hype cycle. So uh, these are various technologies plotted and where decision support system is, well, as of early this year anyway, things can happen really quickly. Um, is still on the on the downslope of hype um, and about to entering disillusion. I personally, I think that um, this is where it says nearly available. Um, it's already available in various forms, uh, various products and systems in Australia, and these are mainly derived from um, uh, US um, based companies. Um, it's hit our shores in Australia. It did. Uh, we had local um, a local version of the FDA as a therapeutic goods administration, and the TGA approved decision support systems only in October last year for use in clinical practice. Um, so, what about some groups that in pros that were actually using um, neural networks? Because again, this is where it's at. This is our future. Um, the legacy of Rule-based systems will always have a place, but um, really this is where all the excitement is. Um, this group in 2018 um, used, uh, well, they, the, the title of their, their, their article is Evaluation of Novel Computer Color Matching System Based on the Improved Backpropagation Neural Network Model. Um, so color matching, I mean, it's something that, again, it's very subjective. Uh, Spectra photometry has been, um, or automated spectral photometry has been attempted over the years. I think with mixed results and obviously mixed uptake, uh, mixed uptake, um, we're very reliant upon our own interpretation, our technicians to get a, to get a color match uh, correct. Um, but this is the architecture of their uh, model, uh, their system. And you can see the input layer, hidden and output layer, and they've talked about the teaching signals, which is obviously their research parameters that they're reporting. Um, the input layer had three key metrics, that being light and A and B are different um, um, hues, the red, green, and, and, and blue, yellow. Um, a big, big punt, red, red, yellow, and blue, green um, uh, hue ranges. Uh, fairly neat study, uh, fairly easy to read, uh, very, very straightforward. Um, in terms of how they uh, controlled for this. Um, they used um, uh, three prosthodontists against the, the automated system, uh, and they found that the, um, the automated system fared significantly better in color distributions when it, when it came to a discriminating hue, um, and that the uh, prosthodontists uh, were insignificantly better uh, in discriminating the, um, the, 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 the value uh, or the lightness, the relative lightness of the, the, the specimen. 
So very simple, very simple um, study and very neat and hopefully replicated in years to come. Uh, that same year, this this group um, published a very, very um, significant, even scary um, publication, which uh, was the which was a, an exhaustive work um, when they teamed up with uh, sorry University of California Berkeley to teamed up with Lytle Dental Laboratories, uh, you know the the longest standing and largest dental laboratory in the US. And they use generative models um, to um, design, uh, design um, and um, and and produce uh, toothbone crowns. So the full CAD CAM workflow, um, that being right from the um, the moment that the data is entered, the data being the, the scan, the scan of the model or the scan of the impression, whichever it is. Um, into their system, the full design without human intervention all the way through to um, uh, production without human intervention um, was, uh, was was what was um, studied and published here. And they used uh, 1,500 um, uh, training specimens and then another, another 1,000 testing specimens. So a large study. And um and a, and a and a very very comprehensive and a very very difficult read, um but yeah it's just it was a really good sign of where things are at. So if you just remember the word generative models for dental restorations here, um, I'll expand on that in a few moments. So we've I've shown you some of the earlier uh, generation um, AI systems in pros in decision support. Uh, I've shown you a couple of more recent ones. 2018 seemed like a big year for this. Um, this, I think, is a really important um, paper for, to help us understand really how all this works um, because they use a thing called the, they developed a thing called the, mach the machine learning spectrum to help us understand. I think it will be something that we'll need to use for years to come. So it's called Big Data and Machine Learning in Healthcare. It's published by the General American Medical Association, Damon Cahane. And what the machine learning spectrum looks like is this. So you've got on the y-axis, the relative human to machine decision-making um, effort. And on the x-axis, it's a uh, the data sample size with an exponential scale. So, um, this this relates then to any particular uh, project, any study, uh, any system that um, that uses um, you know a, a, whether it's humans or fully humans or fully machine or a mixture of both. And so, in the lower lower left corner there, you've got um, pure human um, uh, involvement. That's uh, number twenty two, and they have cited that as being clinical wisdom. So all of us know this. We know that in our careers whether it's uh, the number of patients we see or the number of times we complete a certain procedure or within a scope of practice, uh, we can have up to you know, hundreds of thousands, uh, tens of thousands um, of uh, services or experiences. So that's, that's pretty basic, that's pretty simple to understand. Then when you get to the top row, you've got then a pure machine effort. Uh, there's no human involvement. And these are called generative adversarial networks. And if you look in the in the legend, there it's number one, and it's uh, it was published in first first published in two thousand fourteen. And what a generative adversarial network is um, is is actually a system where there's two neural networks battling out battling it out um, for um, an end sum game of zero. So there's one loser, one winner, one loser. Um, and where there's the humans obviously set the project up, but it's the actual neural networks that arrive at the decision. And this number one that's featured here on the top row, um, this is where um, the, the Huang study sits. So the generative models for the crown restorations that were tooth born. And, uh, and you can see their sample, well, their sample size sat uh, around about the thousand or the ten to the three mark, and there are various other studies that have gone up to you know, hundreds, hundred thousand or so. 
Um, interestingly, when you look at the highest sample study uh, towards, um, you know, a billion, um, uh, and you've got or or, or hundred million, <laughs> um, uh, and beyond, you've and you've got, uh, you know, the, your what's called your convol convolutional neural networks, which is one one step down for the generatives. Uh, you got Facebook photo tagger, and that should be no surprise to all of us. Uh, everyone in this audience is familiar with Facebook, and now you know how um, where they sit on the machine learning spectrum. So if you look at the, the generative adversarial networks, Facebook photo tagger and clinical wisdom, everything else is plotted somewhere in between, okay? So when we look at, say, uh, these particular studies, um, ECHT, which was um, a study published for neural network or machine learning based systems for uh, diagnosis of apical pathology in OPGs, 2019, um, they used, um, again, uh, neural networks. There's the Wang study, uh, 2018. Um, there's the Way study, uh, which was the color matching. And back in 1996, it's just a shout out for this particular study because of how old it was, but how, um, how ahead of their time they were. Brickley in 1996 reported on decisions for uh, third molar surgical management uh, using OPGs, even in time before, you know, cone beam uh, technology, um, before the time that surgeons were using medical CTs for management of third molars. Even back then, um, you know, the researchers were, were had jumped on this and it's, it's fascinating. Um, so if you see then where side study sits, it kind of puts it into perspective then if you see a study where they talk about an algorithmic system, a rule-based system, a statistical probabilistic system, at least on the machine learning spectrum, um, it's not really as relevant in terms of its power and its capabilities as what the neural networks are. Um, but as I said, there's probably always going to be a place in them, uh, whether it's by legacy education or in other environments where you need an audit trail. So that's that's it for now for anyway, unless there's any further questions later on some of the, um, just a, a, just an in introduction to decision support systems. As I said, um, the all the references are listed on the website. Um, it's a little bit easier going now um, because um, it's less technical and more sort of social and um, social and professional. Personalized health is very important. Uh, in our personalized health providers, I beg your pardon, are very important for our future because I believe that they're our main competitors, but they could end up becoming our allies. Um, I'll start with this uh, paper here, published by Fran Osborne. It was a second version um, of this. The first one was in 2013. And as far as I can tell, there's not been one recently, um, but it gave us a good picture at the time uh, of possibly one of the largest studies of um, labor markets um, and um, and their susceptibility to computerization. So Fran Osborne, uh, a couple of um, uh, uh, professors from the Oxford um, School of um, Oxford University School of Economics uh, and Engineering, and they were um, they were asked by the uh, U.S. federal government to study um, 12 different um, um, sectors within the U.S. labor market and rank them uh, 702 occupations um, in accordance with their susceptibility to computerization. Um, so this is uh, their distribution uh, where they use the probability of a zero to one um, the threshold for low being, um, you know, around about the 0.3 and the um, the threshold for high being around about the 0.7. You recognize this as being um, you know, sort of like a, uh, like an inverse of a normal distribution. The, um, where Dennis sat, uh, all the various dental professions or occupations that they identified where they sat, 
um, was all in the very, very safe um, area before that sort of inflection point at around about 0.1. Um, and those of you in the audience who might be surgeons and general dentists, you'll be pleased to know that similar um, uh, similar occupations that sat on your rank include people like firefighters, police, um, frontline workers, um, orthodontists, health education, uh, health, health educators and prosthodontists also featured here. Um, and um, there weren't any other dental professional um, uh, sectors included, but there were some auxiliaries and dental technicians which featured further down to medium and, and high susceptibility. Um, so that was just that's just an introduction to say that we're safe, but yeah. how safe are we? Um, everyone's familiar with um, Invisalign. Everyone's familiar with Align technology or Align aligners. This is a big must be a big part of digitodontics itself, as well as um, really um, uh, was uh, probably one of the key disruptors of digital technologies in dentistry. Um, but there's a story, and um, the story goes with uh, Invisalign Smile Direct Club. Um, uh, rather, the story of Invisalign is very should have very heavily feature the impact of Smile Direct Club. Smile Direct Club, just Mumwood, can you just give me an idea about how present? What's the presence of Smile Direct Club in in France and Europe? Sorry, Ken. Can you just give me an idea about what presence Smile Direct Club has in Europe and, and in France? Actually, it's very difficult. Um, they're not. They're not. Are they around or they're not around? Or I'm not. I'm not familiar with how they perform in Europe. That's all. Yeah, I'm, I think they are around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this. Thanks. This. This section here is founded less on dental publications and more on um, uh, just obviously this list of um, uh, publications that comes both from uh, finance sort of um, websites and some from, you know, um, uh, just general narrative websites. The, uh, uh, the, Align, um, the Align company or Align Technologies, which is... Um, the producer of Invisalign aligners. They formed in 1997 by a couple of Stanford University graduates uh, who weren't dentists. And they, um, they had an idea to um, use full CAD CAM to be able to produce um, the sequential plastic aligners concept. Um, it took them a while for them to really gain any interest. And by the time they went um, public, uh, they'd made a Quite a big loss, but they kept at it, and they saw their first profits um, right about seven years in operation. Um, things grew for them, and, and but by the time their international patents started running out, around about the seventeen to twenty year mark, um, they uh, there was the emergence of Smile Direct Club. Smile Direct Club in two thousand and fourteen formed uh, in the US as a service that went direct to public. Um, the initial concept was um, that you would uh, subscribe to this service and they would send you uh, the materials in the post. You would then take the impressions um, and the, the registration. You would send that back and then um, they would send you a set of aligners for you to undertake your treatment. Um, they uh, had also set up some kiosks throughout the US uh, to be able to help um, you know, sort of bring people into the market and then bring people into the concept. Um, but it was pretty much just a shop front for the service. Um, Smile Direct Club set up a supply agreement with Invisalign or Align Technologies when Align uh, realized that it was a, a um, it was something they really wanted um, to be a part of. And by the time that they uh, had formalized all their supply agreements, Align Technologies had a 19% share in Small Direct Club. So they bought into their competitor and um, and they they did a few um, interesting um, things which Small Direct Club didn't like um, and including uh, setting up 
uh, some stores uh, to compete against Smeldrick Club, as well as, um, from what I understand, there was a breach of the a, a, um, a labor agreement in uh, some offshore uh, services <clears throat> outside of the US. Um, so Smeldrick Club sued Invisalign and um, a court in Nashville upheld in favor of Smeldrick Club. Um, right at the time that Invisalign was, or Align Technologies was, was hitting its peak business. Um, Invisal or Align Technologies was uh, thereafter ordered um, by this court to close down all their stores um, and the non-compete period was extended to August 2022, that being earlier this year, and Smilder Club, um, sorry, I, I think Align Technologies was ordered to um, sell their uh, their uh, investments uh, back to Smilderick Club at the original sale price, um, and as I understand, that was um, that was fought out quite acrimoniously and um, resulted in um, a, a a better price or a better outcome for Line Technologies than what was their original um, order. So um, <clears throat> in the meantime. Uh, these patents, uh, by this 20-year mark that had started to uh, expire, um, rapidly losing, <clears throat> in Align Technology, rapidly losing their, their expirations, uh, rapidly losing their patents, um, and they'll be they'll keep going to the year 2028. Um, so in the meantime, we've seen the emergence, obviously, of other Aligner businesses, um, but Smile Direct Club was quite the most significant one because of this lawsuit. Um, leading into the non the, the end of the non compete period early this year, um, things got things have got nasty again between the two companies um, in a California court early this year in February. Um, <clears throat> the um, Align Technologies was um, uh, alleged that they uh, breached antitrust laws, so a class action was uh, launched against them, and this relates to the original handshake uh, agreement between Align Technologies and Smile Direct Club um, that one couldn't do what the other could do. That being um, the principle that Align Technologies couldn't set up stores and Smile Direct Club couldn't engage the professional bodies. Um, uh, that being that they couldn't reciprocate each other's service in itself was a breach of an antitrust law in California. Uh, more likely here in the Federal Court of Australia, um, the um, ACC, which is the Australian uh, Consumer Composite Commission for Consumer Competition, um, um, uh, sued uh, Smell Direct Club for uh, misleading the public. And this relates to uh, Smell Direct Club's um, activities where they were able to convince members of the public that there was um, health. Uh, healthcare rebates and benefits available if they were to run it through their uh, company, if they run the services through their company. And only uh, last week was, or the last two weeks, was there a decision handed down in the federal court that Smile Direct Club uh, owed $3.5 million in damages uh, to various entities. So it's a pretty um, hectic environment. And you can ask, well, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us that are not necessarily in, you know, as dentists and as um, uh, researchers or clinical researchers as well, what does it mean for us um, in terms of where we sit? If you look at how many cases Align Technologies has acquired over the years, um, they sit really high uh, on this exponential graph on the machine learning spectrum. Um, much, much more than any individual orthodontist or dentist will ever reach, or even a group of orthodontists will ever reach um, They, um, for any single study. They've got access to this amount of data. And so it would be um, obviously clearly like a commercial IP, commercial secrets to how they manage it, how high up they go, whether they're using generative adversarial networks. Um, but if I was a punter, I'd say it's pretty. It's a pretty safe bet to say that they don't have one single person looking at every 
single case of the million cases that comes through every single year. So what does this mean? Um, does this mean that their systems and their AI um, and their um, diagnostic service or their diagnostic power, whether it, when it comes to both, um, you know, the occlusal scheme, uh, the aesthetic scheme um, can be that powerful that it can outstrip the performance of orthodontists. Um, is Align Technologies um, that powerful enough a company to be able to acquire other um, uh, technologies from other areas, whether it's digital smile design, whether it's um, implant companies to be able to contribute to their pool uh, and their spectrum of data when it comes to diagnosis uh, from occlusal anesthetic perspectives. Um, will Align Technology become the Facebook of dentistry, um, you know. So I think it's very much a watch this space. Um, I, in my view, Align Technologies, my prediction, and I'm really willing to go out and live and say this, but I can't see why not, why they wouldn't set up kiosk and direct to public um, eventually. Uh, and then with access to um, other clinical technologies such as optical coherence tomography scanners, um, social robots, um, and generative adversarial network and neural network-based decision support systems. I can't see why they wouldn't be able to eventually develop diagnostic services that would compete very, very heavily against professionals. Um, so very much watch this space. Uh, again, the topic of governance, this is really, um, uh, this is where the domain of responsible AI, social and ethical infrastructure. Uh, I'm just going to really just describe some of these uh, elements and how it's how it's relevant in Australia and how I see it. Um, again, regulation or rather um, Therapeutic Goods Administration Australia for decision support systems really as only as recently as October last year. Um, is when it was approved. So all of a sudden we saw, um, uh, we've seen at least four different commercial enterprises enter Australia. Some were ready in standard stand in some practices uh, where they, um, they badged themselves as being able to use AI or AI driven or machine learning driven systems to assist dentists in um, uh, diagnostic services, including interpretation of radiographs, um, you know, um, interpretation of aesthetic and occlusal data. Um, and so um, it's, to me, it's very, even though it's been launched through, it's been approved through TGA, it's very much pre-regulation. Um, we're, we're still waiting on things. I think the things happen, whether it's from an adverse outcome all the way through to um, at one end, um, all the way through to um, solid proven data science and clinical science driven technologies at the other end. The Australian Dental Association has, uh, uh, Australian Dental Association has a uh, digital health and informatics uh, subcommittee that's been on this um, topic of responsible AI and governance and how it affects us as a profession. Uh, they've been onto this for the past few years. It's a very strong um, community led by um, dentists who are members of the ADA and with very um, diverse background in um, data sciences and informatics. Um, the Australian Health Practitioner Regulatory Agency uses um, AI to um, assist uh, the monitoring performance of practitioners and sometimes even in the um, uh, in the uh, remediation uh, processes more as a group rather than individuals. The Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in, in Healthcare um, is um, the was was is is really at the the, gov the, the key government agency in Australia. Um, that um, uh, has the, the overarching body for our what's uh, is all our public services, including Medicare, our our you know our public health initiatives. 
and um, decision support systems have been well defined by them um, for over 10 years uh, since uh, and where there was a landmark study in 2014 that spoke um, about some of the recommendations uh, for uh, the implementation of decision support systems and how shared, shared support systems are just as if not more relevant in our society. Consumer data rights are very important um, consideration for the broader profession and community. In context, it's something that's very new in Australia. Um, it's it's only been a hit. The, the, the only sector in Australia that's been uh, hit with this is the financial services um, sector, but um, healthcare or energy is up next and healthcare is just around the corner. Um, what it really does is it puts the... Um, the power of data um, ownership back into that of the consumer. So for example, in Australia, um, these days, as opposed to four years ago, if you're looking to refinance your mortgage on your home or your practice or, or your facility or whatever property you own, and you um, are looking to get a, get a better deal from another bank, you don't have to fill out 45 pages of application uh, in the application process, you give that second bank um, uh, approval for them to access the data of that's yours from your current bank um, because you own that data. And um, and there's there'll be eventually an overhaul for that for um, us as a society where eventually we'll have moved to an electronic health record, centralized medical records, um, and dentistry will become part of that. Social performance is another um, initiative that's featured in Australia. I'm not sure about elsewhere in the world, but it's a big deal here because we've had some unfortunate scenarios of mining companies um, destroying um, uh, sacred land that's um, that belongs to First Nations people. Um, and so every uh, large a uh, company that um, has an impact on the environment and the community um, needs to have, a, these days in Australia, needs to have a social performance policy um, so that it shows that they have engaged the community, they've engaged the uh, constituent that their company's activities are affecting, both from um, a geographical a resources, a political um, and a human rights perspective. Uh, I see this as being something that the larger the a data science company gets larger an AI system gets, um, the more important their social performance needs to be accounted for. And uh, the United Nations um, has, uh, as recently as last year, published um, in their policy area uh, ten to eleven um, how um, the few how uh, automation and how uh, artificial intelligence will affect us both as communities in the context of healthcare, but also in terms of uh, context of labor markets and how um, how 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 artificial intelligence will impact us for our jobs. So there's a there's a principle that goes on the one hand, um, you know, which is our our dystopian, um, misanthropic sort of um, fear and nightmare that uh, will be overtaken by machines uh, at this point of whether it's Terminator or the technological singularity. Um, but then there's also a counter argument um, for which says that for every job that is lost through automation, new jobs are created, uh, at least on a one-to-one -one basis. And there have been some uh, pretty good studies that have um, have talked about this from, from uh, pretty uh, reputable uh, environments, including MIT, uh, their study in 2020, 21, um, which a very comprehensive um, paper that talked about this as well. Um, so, what what what's around? What can what can help us? both in terms of uh, understanding how this works, how does AI work, but also how can we use AI in our various education environments in dentistry, whether it's um, undergraduate, whether it's extension of practice, whether it's um, you know, uh, professional education. 
the way I see it is that um, there are, you know, whether you're uh, purely in clinical practice, whether you're in education environment, whether you're doing research, um, the way it needs to be done, the way I see it is that, you know, there needs to be, the integration needs to be synergistic. This is just the world according to Ken at this point in time. Um, so instead of the world according to Ken, um, I I saw this um, TED talk a little while back and it was fascinating. So I decided to reach out to um, the author, um, the educator, the, the orator, um, and interview him, Scott Boland. I would really, even though it was 2016, it's really fascinating. Um, this gentleman coded happiness. He's a neuroscience, cognitive scientist and education technologist. And through his work, um, he coded happiness. Um, and I won't go into that too much. Um, I'll let you guys figure, figure it out and be uh, be fascinated by it. But, but essentially the projects that they run um, in, for school children, uh, for school environments, mainly primary uh, education, at uh, this stage, but uh, moving on, you know, uh, to higher education. Um, the three levels include rote learning, um, and you know, and this is standard. This is exa exactly what we do, um, you know, and this is where the um, is what we do. A bigger pun, both at professional development um, and at um, um, whether it's an undergraduate or postgraduate or board degree level. Uh, and this is this type of technology is your rule-based algorithmic and probabilistic statistical systems. The level two is generative AI, where this example here, where the um, the student's playing a recorder, the system um, recognizes both your uh, your accuracy, your your precision um, against the set task. Um, it then feeds back according to your rate of learning. And where it's uh, really fascinating with this talk is he talks about um, uh, for a school teacher to be able to have a generative system as an assistant in the classroom so that all 30 students in that classroom have customized learning and they proceed at the rate that's, that is customized to them, not to the, the average in the class. Uh, then there's level three, which is integrative AI, where it takes the generative systems and uh, combines it with these various um, technologies of simulated worlds, virtual reality, and gesture recognition. Please visit this. It's only, I think, 17 minutes, but it's it's a great watch. So I approached Scott. He's, he's a Brisbane-based um, uh, cognitive scientist. Um, he's got a great website. He's um, like he's he's got a very broad um, scope of practice. I approached him with a couple of questions um, because he knew that I was coming from the perspective of um, prosthodontics and dentistry um, and asked him how similar is the evolution of AMR, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in school education to that of course, of vocational coursework in the professional development education. Um, my expectation obviously, and I think I know what's running through your minds is that because we're a lot narrower than school children, it should be a lot easier. Um, and he, his answer was that in terms of vocational coursework education, there are many similarities with school training projects. And when it comes to professional development, um, Mahmoud, you'll be pleased to know, um, at the moment, they're just focused more on technical skills acquired via rote learning, as opposed to soft skills training, yeah. which are difficult to automate, which at some point, um, we'll see a lot more of. Uh, these are really easy to find online, um, navigation.com. Um, I'm not sure where this school is, this dental school, but these students are lucky enough to have uh, generative systems that give them feedback on, on their performance. And of course, these, are, these systems are assistance to the human educators um, that are roving around um, assisting these lucky students or, or supervising these lucky students. Um, here's another example of using, uh, or here's an example using augmented reality. Um, there's virtual reality and there's augmented reality. Uh, augmented reality is where you're still um, using some 
uh, input from the real world, whereas virtual reality, it's a full um, uh, virtual world um, experience. And this was in implant uh, surgery. And um, you can see here that the, the headset's called the HoloLens, uh, where they have real time um, sort of interaction uh, with the system, um, which models exactly you know where they're tracking it, uh, in accordance with um, the input uh, cone beam scan um, imaging that's uh, that's being fed, or that was rather that was um, that was featured as part of the the existing data, and then the the whole lens plus the assistance of um, Implanav, which is a navigation system. Uh, I'm certain you guys have heard about navigation. I won't go too on too much about it, but it's essentially GPS uh, within a room, and um, and and how that all blends and translates uh, from um, you know the start of the surgery, well, the interpretation of the data, for the start of the surgery procedures, and the and the completion of the intervention is um, is quite fascinating, and they found what they believe are pretty favorable results. Uh, and it's no surprise that where virtual reality sits on the heart, uh, the Gartner hype cycle um, is that it's still on the rise, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more of this in the future before we know it. So again, I've um, I've taken us through some uh, some pretty hardcore data science specific technologies. Um, I've talked about what I think is our greatest um, threat as as clinicians uh, to our jobs and our and our careers. Um, I've talked about um, some of the uh, broader issues with governance, which I think um, are really they're, they're going to evolve in the wake of the actual technological advancements, um, uh, which is normally how things are when it comes to technologies. And I've talked a little bit about how we can go about it. So I want to finish off with a couple of quotes, um, which brings it back to the fact that we're all humans and there are no machines. I hope there are no bots on this on this webinar, Mahmoud. <laughs> um, but um, the first quote is from um, the greatest cricketer, one of the greatest sportsmen ever. And it's, it's a responsibility of those that play the game, the custodians to leave the game in a better state than when they first became involved. I think as a group, that's how we are. We're custodians in dentistry and prosthodontics, in education <clears throat> and research. And uh, the second quote is uh, from an American polymath uh, and Noam Chomsky, uh, which is a very old quote from his, uh, if you assume that there is no hope, you guarantee that there will be no hope. Uh, if you assume that there is an instinct for freedom, that there are opportunities to change things, there's a possibility you can contribute to making a better world. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to thank Mahmoud again for inviting me along. I'd like to thank you all for giving up your time to um, listen to me um, uh, just talk a little bit of broad stuff and um, and uh, hope that your interests will be maintained or retained enough so that I can come back with some real world, real hardcore stuff uh, in six months or so um, yeah. that will be um, you know, we'll be there. Thank you so much, uh, Ken. It was very interesting and very um, informative um, lecture that uh, you went through different uh, perspectives regarding the um, artificial intelligence. You divided us through the clinical technologies um, and uh, the artificial intelligence that are used within the clinical technologies. Then you move it uh, uh, with us to the uh, personalized healthcare, which is the um, some um, uh, direction will go to that uh, that perspective as well because it's very um, uh, important as well. And then you mentioned about the governance and how the uh, professional bodies how to uh, engage in artificial intelligence, which is very important to regulate the, uh, the 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 entire process for the artificial intelligence. And finally, you mentioned about the education technologies that uh, have been uh, using the artificial intelligence, which is very important uh, in terms of uh, 
improve the uh, proficiency of the um, education in, in, in our profession. So um, uh, once again, I would like to ask the uh, participants if they have any questions, just write them down. So uh, uh, Ken will be happy to answer uh, the questions. Um, Ken, um, as you mentioned that the artificial intelligence uh, go back to maybe 1997 for the prosthodontics where the uh, UK group trying to um, uh, generate something regarding removable partial dentures. But what I uh, noted that since 2018, many um, uh, dentists or scientists are focused on artificial intelligence in, in, in the prosthodontics or in, 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 in dental, on dentistry in general. Do you think that is, uh, uh, where they uh, see the importance of the artificial intelligence, then people start to think about it. What do you think about that? Oh, sorry. What's a good, when do you think that we'll start to think about it? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, I mean, they, uh, they realized that the importance of the uh, artificial intelligence for dentistry, uh, from what I have seen, is since 2018. Do you yeah. think that they they realize it, the importance of the uh, artificial intelligence uh, for dentistry? Yeah, look, I think 2018 seemed like um, a moment in time. As, as so, so the, these are um, these are these are publications that I've come across through what's what's effectively a hand search. Okay, I haven't done. Um, a formal, um, you know, sort of midline research on these in this area. Um, it's very much a hand search. the The first one, the first one that I could see that was published anywhere in dentistry was nineteen eighty two, um, in the endodontic diagnosis, where they used a probabilistic system. I think two thousand eighteen seemed seems like it was um, a, a reasonable sort of uh, inflection point for the shift from rule-based systems to neural networks. I, I'm, my interpretation is because of the, um, the emergence of generative adversarial networks. So neural networks, like I said, have been around since, you know, World War II type thing. Um, there was a neural network on third molar surgery, um, uh, diagnosis and management, in 1996, um, but a lot of the interest was really in rule-based systems. And to me, my interpretation is because this is um, the activity of um, our intellects um, and our uh, and and our um, uh, so our intellects in in education institutions um, who um, have both. Um, access to resources of time, uh, money, but also um, the collective intellect to be able to then codify their expertise into an automated system. Um, and as well as that um, environments where there's, um, whether it's government agency or whether it's a larger institution, where they've got access to um, larger amounts of data um, where they um, they can then start to apply some of these um, these these automated systems for improved efficiency, but um, but I think that this this sort of this concept of a legacy of an expert um, will always be necessary in an educational environment, but and also in terms of in a in a government in a governance uh, environment, because you need to have humans writing the rules. Okay, and you need to have humans that are experts in their domains to be able to contribute to the overall pool of the rules. But when it comes to, and I'm talking about legislation and I'm talking about standards, but when it comes to actual advancements of techniques to make things um, more precise, more accurate, safer, more proficient, more efficient, cheaper, um, more cost efficient, more uh, energy 
uh, conservative. Um, I think that, you know, the, it's clear to me that every other industry is moving with neural networks. And, and if you look at, say, for instance, finance and accounting, um, the rule-based systems are always going to be needed for their operations. But when it comes to a business um, um, with their um, strategic modelling, that's where their um, that's where neural networks will be able to assist them more efficiently and give them that competitive advantage. So if you look at that as an industry that uses both, I, the way I see it is that our profession will use both what's called the expert systems or weak AI, yeah. um, as well as the neural networks and machine learning. Um, when will it happen? I think the convergence of a few technologies, OCTs, I think will be a disruptive technology by 2026. I think decision support systems, um, I, I've, I've, I hate to say it, but I think they'll be guided. I think the key guider for the key parameter, for, the key barometer for that will be the performance of aligned technologies um, and the emergence of personalized health, basically of diagnostic, uh, specialized diagnostic kiosks. I think that's going to drive the profession faster to be able to then recognize that we've got a true competitor in our diagnostic services. So if I was to pin a date on it, where there's a convergence of all these different technologies, my guess is 2026, 2027, that's when we'll actually see a lot because the the OCT University College in London has a four year PhD in dent in specific dental OCT and that only started this year. So I think that will that can, that lucky candidate and our lucky profession will see, you know, their their publications emerge over the next few years as their work grows and as it matures. So as that information as that technology becomes available. Um, you know, um, then it's it's game on. Yeah. Now, uh, Ken, um, as expertise in this area, what are the challenges that facing prosthodontics to be more engaged in artificial intelligence? Um, I think. I, I think. You are the, you, you are a prosthodontist and you are expertise in artificial intelligence. So, yeah. Well, if I look at if I go if I can, are you still sharing my screen? Ah, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you can, if you can just share the screen again. Yeah. Um. Thank you for the question. Um. This is this is actually a slide that I presented to the Academy of Australian New Zealand Prosthodontists because I raised to them the hypothetical question, if we were to remain on top of disruptive technologies in practice, education and life, we've got a lot of opportunities to be able to um, reskill very efficiently. Um, so whether if we're a prosthodontist, we've also got to be thinking ourselves really as dentists, yeah. as dental specialists, as clinicians, or whether we've got a, an academic role whether we've got a research role. Um, I think the key thing here is engagement of other professionals because prosthodontics, we, we, you know, there are many sectors, there are many things that we do where we're, we are really still old school and we hang on to a lot of old school principles because we know that outcomes of 10, 15, 20 years you know, those sorts of studies are really, they're just as valuable as anything that's cutting edge. Um, but on the other hand, we love our toys and we love, you know, we love being able to explore things when we've got really cool tools and really yep. cool things to help in achieving what we want efficiently uh, and remove a lot of our redundancies. So we're uh, to me, in terms of the clinical technologies, we are pretty much in the same boat we're all in the same boat when it comes to dentists, whether we're dentists yeah. or dental specialists. I think as prosthodontists, and to those prosthodontists in the audience, you'll you'll understand what I mean. We've all, all of us have some sort of education role within or leadership role within the profession. And some have a lot, some have a little, some have occasional, some are full-time, some are part-time. Yeah. But the key thing is that it's the engagement with the profession. So if we, if we, we, 
if we as prosthodontists recognize that we can still play a role with leadership or with education, then um, then it's up to us to be able to then go as data scientific as we can in the way that we went material scientific or clinical scientific or system surgical surgical scientific yeah. you know you know what I mean? or interfacial scientific with all the other disciplines so i i see with prosthodontists again from the clinical technologies at the moment we're in the same boat as dentists or, or as, as general dentists and other dental specialists we're all in the same boat yeah. but from a engagement perspective and, and um, leadership in education we've got a lot of opportunities yeah and uh, what about the technical issues that because if you need to go to that direction you should have intensive technical skills to apply artificial intelligence <laughs> yeah this this is this is the thing I, I i think that you need like like any I think it's going to be in the context of extension of scope of practice. So yeah. I don't I don't necessarily see that you need to have I mean I'm I'm attempting through my pursuit I'm attempting to acquire some technical competency. You know, I wouldn't be I'm, I don't know if at the end of my course I'll be able to say I'm a bona fide data scientist, but I but you know I want to be able to have an understanding about how they actually work from a data science perspective. Yeah. And I think that uh dentists shouldn't have to go through that i'm just doing it because i'm interested um but i think when it comes to patient care it comes back to any other technology and that is that as long as you know that it's got a scientific basis that it's the data is clean um the studies that have contributed to the training and testing of that system um are ethical um, they've been performed um, in peer-reviewed environments. They're replicated or they're replicable. All the things that go with normal technologies that are founded upon research, whether it's clinical research or bench research, yep. the same rules should apply. And I think that as long as dentists are able to equip themselves with some basic understanding of what data science is and what artificial intelligence is, then my hope is that eventually we'll be able to discriminate clean from corrupt, ethical from unethical, responsible from irresponsible, compliant from non-compliant. Yeah, I think um, your webinar will be a great contribution to um, give this opportunity for all the dentists to understand the importance of the artificial intelligence um, for dentistry and for the profession. Um, and um, I guess the uh, next one would be more advanced one. So I guess many people need to be go further to understand sure. what's going on for the artificial intelligence. So uh, yeah, with that, uh, Ken, I would like um, to thank you for your time. And uh, I know it's very late in, in Sydney. Um, I let you wake uh, until this time. But right. uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll go. Uh, so I'll start with patients tomorrow. So that's fine. So, <laughs> so uh, once again, I I I thank you for the time and um, for everything that you uh, shared with us today. And uh, as a tradition for uh, digital dentics, we are glad to uh, present you a certificate of of appreciation. So we right. hereby uh, express our sincere appreciation to Dr. Ken Huey in recognition of his contribution as a live webinar uh, speaker for the Digital Dontics webinar series in the topic of artificial intelligence in prosthodontics that was presented on uh, Thursday, November 24th, 2022. So Ken, I'm so, so glad to have you with me um, today. Um, it was a great pleasure for me. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for Have a nice no uh, night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Until next time. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good. Ciao.